Well, hello everybody. Again, it is certainly nothing like meeting together. We certainly miss you guys. And uh, this has been very difficult being apart, uh, not being able to get together, not being able to fellowship, not being able to, to talk with one another and give each other hugs and, and share with each other face to face. But praise the Lord again for technology and the fact that we have his word and we can still get into it together and we can communicate by phone and stay in touch with each other. Know that we're praying for you. We appreciate your prayers and so look forward to that day that we believe is very soon that we'll be able to get together again uh, in fellowship face to face. But in the meantime, this is what we have. We have the uh, we have uh, video recording equipment. We have YouTube. We have this way of of getting into the Word together. So let's do that. Uh, if you'd grab your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter eighteen today. Matthew chapter eighteen. And let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your constant presence in such uncertain times. Uh, Lord, as we continue to face seems day after day new things that uh, we seem it, it seems like it can't get weirder it can't get crazier and then the next day comes and more things keep coming out and uh, Lord we we are so thankful that we have you to lean on we have you to look to uh, the one who is the same yesterday today and forever uh, Lord we thank you for the peace that comes just even if, with communing with you in prayer uh, and Lord, we thank you for your word that we can turn to, that we can uh, find your comfort, your peace, your truth in your living word. So bless our time today as we study your word together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew 18. Interesting, we come to this section in Matthew 18 that... Uh, that is almost synonymous with the chapter. Uh, it's interesting if you've been around church long enough, if you've been around especially uh, uh, church circles, people that have been around church for a long time, they even use the phrase Matthew 18 and people know what that means. Uh, it, it, it deals with church discipline. But I will say um, <laughs> this section is one of the sections of scripture that has been abused uh, I believe in a couple of different ways. Uh, one, uh, because it's been misused, uh, mis misinterpreted, mis misused for personal gain, uh, but also because it has been neglected. Um, there's two sides, there's two ditches uh, on either side. People use Matthew 18 for almost anything, any problem that they have. Matthew 18, Matthew 18, uh, totally taking it out of context for that, I believe. But also uh, the other side of it, we're just completely neglecting and, and pushing away what Jesus commands us to do as followers of his. Now, the verses we're going to look at today, beginning in verse 15 through the end of the chapter, are found only in the Gospel of Matthew. So we'll be looking exclusively there for our Gospel account, although Paul speaks of it. Uh, John speaks of some things that we'll be turning to, uh, so we will be uh, going to other places in Scripture as we, as we move through our study today. But let's begin, Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15, Jesus speaking, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Again, this is recorded for us only in Matthew's account, Matthew's gospel, but it is a continuation of what we finished up looking at last week. 
There was no chapter break. There, is, there were no verses. There was no uh, pause in this. This continues to flow. It ties directly to the parable that we looked at at the very end of last week. Notice, go back to verse 12. Jesus said, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If he turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. Jesus is continuing on in that line of thought. Now, before we go too much further into the study, it is important, if you're looking at a New King James Version or a King James Version, you'll notice that there's a slight difference, especially at the very beginning of verse 15. Verse 15 in the New King James and King James begins with the word moreover, and that word is in the original language, and it does tie it to, directly to, the parable that we just looked at, the 99 sheep, the one that left. Um, it, it ties it directly. It's a conjunction. It ties the two together. So that, that word, that conjunction, it's translated but or and, here translated moreover, tying the sections together. But you'll also notice that in the King James Version or New King James Version, it says, if your brother sins, and it adds the two words against you. Now, those two words are not in the earliest manuscripts. And I think that that's important as we begin, begin this study, because... A lot of times these verses are used when someone gets their feelings hurt or, or when someone is disappointed or, or someone misses expectations and they come that and then they make this a very personal situation. And I don't believe that that is Jesus heart and what he is saying with this. Um, we're going to see when we get down into the next section, down into verse 21, Jesus deals with what happens when someone sins against you? When someone sins against you personally, how we deal with that. Jesus is speaking here again, directly tying it to the previous parable about a sheep that has gone astray. A brother or sister who, who has fallen away. He's speaking of Christians, those that are professing a faith in him, following him, that have wandered away from the faith, who have strayed away. And notice again, tying it directly to the previous parable, the heart of a shepherd is to go find and restore that one who has wandered away. The goal is restoration. The goal is to bring them back, not to embarrass them, not to humiliate them. It doesn't involve retaliation or retribution. It is all about restoration, going and finding that one and bringing them back. Now, Jesus says, if your brother sins, it's important that we start right there. Who defines what sin is? Who determines the one that needs to be go, gone after and why they need to be gone after? Well, I, the obvious answer is God defines that. It's by God's standards. The sin, the, the error, the thing that we need to go and discuss with that person or go and deal with that person about needs to be a biblical thing. We need to be able to point to scripture and say, this is where you're sinning. This is where you have missed the mark. This is the area in your life that needs to be dealt with and addressed. Turn with me to Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five. Paul writes this to the church in Galatia, again, chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. He, he draws a distinction, again, even within the life of a believer, that there are still two elements. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives and resides inside of every born-again believer. He is the seal. He is the guarantee of our salvation, the Holy Spirit in us. But we still carry around, we are still in this body of flesh. 
We still face temptation. We still have that desire within us. The old man, though crucified with Christ, still there. And there is this battle that is going on. Paul talks about this continual battle, but if we are walking in the Spirit, we do not carry out the desires of the flesh. If we are walking as Christians, if we are following and walking as we should be, we are not falling into temptation. We're not carrying out the desires of the flesh. And he goes on to say this in verse 19, and this is very important for everyone. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. This is not some kind of uh, secret thing. They're evident. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality. Paul's speaking of sexual sin that deals with any type of sexual sin, whether it be adultery, fornication, homosexuality, any type of sexual sin Idolatry, verse 20, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, those things that come in and tear apart uh, churches and relationships. Envying, 21, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice those things, those who make a lifestyle out of those things, that is what the world does. That is, that is what we did prior to coming to faith in Christ. We lived for our flesh. We, we sought after those things. We chased after those things. And he says, those will not inherit the kingdom of God. Goes on, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The, the, the direct distinction, again, and we can see how those two things, the spirit and the flesh, are constantly battling against each other in our lives, and they can't walk harmoniously together. They are ap opposites of each other, fighting against each other. He goes on, now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those things should be dead to us. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Paul goes into great detail here that as Christians, our walk should be defined by godly things, by those spiritual elements, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that should, those are the things that should define us. That is how we should walk. Now along those lines as well, turn, turn to the book of 1 John. 1 John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, John writes this, this is the message that we have heard from him, Jesus. Jesus directly gave this message to them, and we announce it to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. It is not that God chooses not to have darkness. Notice John says that God is light. And because of that fact, there is no darkness in him. It is the opposite of him. He is holy. And because of that, there can be no unholiness in him. He is truth. And because of that, there can be no distruth, no, no lies with him. It's not that God chooses not to lie. He can't lie because of who he is. There is no darkness in him at all. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I go to these two sections, Galatians 5 and 1 John, because it outlines for us as Christians, as those who profess a faith in Jesus, those who are, who are following after him, who have been washed in his blood, cleansed of our sin, children of God, this is how we are to walk. And as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, th- we're not going to be able to walk in darkness. We're not going to be able to give in to a lifestyle following after the desires of our flesh. Does this mean that we will never sin? No. But it does mean that when we sin, the Holy Spirit brings conviction in our life and that conviction leads to repentance. And that repentance leads to full restoration. And it is, that is a continual lifestyle. That is a process that continues day after day after day. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more our desire is to be more and more like him. And yes, the process involves understanding and realizing that there are still areas and elements in our lives that are not yet Christ-like, but we continually bring that to him and allow him to live through us. That process, <laughs> conviction, repentance, restoration, cleansing. I say all of that to say that Matthew 18 is to deal with with those who profess a faith in the Lord Jesus who are not walking in this way. It's not that they're perfect. It's not that our job is to go around as the sin police and look for every little thing that we see that doesn't line up and and address it and go after this and go after that. No, we need to let the Holy Spirit do the Holy Spirit's job and that's bringing conviction and that's gonna happen in the life of, of believers as we go through this. But this is dealing with unacknowledged or unrepentant sin. Someone who professes to be a believer yet insists on living in a sinful lifestyle, refusing to repent. Jesus, now back to Matthew chapter 18, tells us how it is that we are to deal with that. If we see this action, this attitude in a fellow believer, Verse 15 tells us, go and show him his fault. Notice, in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Now, can I say the first thing that we need to do before we jump into verse 15 is pray. We need to pray, pray, pray. Pray first that God would give us the words to say, the heart that we need in order to be an effective tool for him to do the work that he desires to do. We need to pray for that individual that God would already be working on their heart because here's the fact of the matter, we're not going to be able to change their heart. Only God can change hearts. So we need to be praying that God would already be doing that work and the Holy Spirit would bring conviction and there would be repentance. But it tells us that we are to go to them directly, face to face. We are to show them their sin. And again, that is why it is vitally important that it is something that God calls sin. Not something that we have a personal bent against or we have a personal issue with. No, it's something that God calls sin where we can turn in the word of God to them with them and say, notice, this is what God says. And I'm concerned for you because I see this in you. And here is what God's word says about that. Also, Go to him, show in private, one-on-one, especially in the first step. You go to them individually. You go to them privately. This is not a social media event. This is not even a call up a bunch of people and and say, hey, pray for me. I need to go to talk and talk with so-and-so about this. That's gossip. You need to pray It's okay to ask for people to to pray with you, but give them no specifics about anybody individually. Again, go to them in private. Notice if he hears you, you gain a brother. 
that person comes back. And again, we notice, we know from the parable that Jesus just told, told earlier, the rejoicing that goes on in heaven, how happy the Lord is when someone returns back. And what an awesome thing that God would allow us to be a part of that process. But verse 16 says, if he does not listen to you, take two or three more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he doesn't listen, he or she doesn't listen when you go to them individually, privately, then you go and you get two or three to come with you. It is vitally important <laughs> that these are godly people. You're not just out recruiting people that are going to jump on and believe whatever it is that you say. No, it needs to be again. You go and you show them this is biblically. This is what is going on. Spiritual godly people. Galatians 6. We looked at the end of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 6 starts off this way. Galatians 6 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Again, the goal is restoration with a compassionate heart, a gentle heart. We're going after a brother or a sister who has, has wandered away. It says that if, if this doesn't work, if all of you, again, going with the right heart and, and taking this to them and they still insist on that, it says then step three, take it to the church, take it to the leadership within the church. This should be a rare exception. Again, for the most part, when a believer is confronted with, with sin, a true born-again believer, bringing it biblically, bringing it prayerfully, for the most part, that's going to lead to repentance. That is going to lead to conviction and the Holy Spirit working in the heart of that individual. But if this doesn't work, and again, in that rare exception taking it to the church and the church dealing with it, the church again bringing maybe a little bit more authority with this is what God's word says. But if they still refuse, they still insist on this type of lifestyle, then Jesus says to turn them away, turn them out of the church. Treat them as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. What he's saying is those, you know, again, the, 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 the sinners, to treat them as, as though they were not part of the body. Doesn't mean that we ignore them just like we wouldn't the, the, the sinners, but they are not to be treated as part of the body because they are basically, by their, their refusal to repent, saying that they are not part of the body. Now, again, the entire goal is always still the same. Jesus isn't turning turn them over to hell. No, it's always with the heart that they will recognize their sin, that they will understand that this is wrong and how the seriousness of it and repent and come back. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 5.5 5, in dealing with an issue within the church, a similar situation we're talking about, refusing to repent, refusing to change. He says, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Again, the destruction of his flesh, that which is in contrast with the spirit, that which is fighting the spirit in him, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I know for a fact, as a born again believer that wandered away as a prodigal, I, I can speak from experience. That is the most miserable place to be. A lot of people think that, that being, being a totally lost sinner is the most miserable place. No, the most miserable place, the most miserable person is that born again believer that is trying to live out in the world, that is trying to chase after those things, that is doing that. Because you have too much of God in you to enjoy the world and too much of wor in the world of you in you to enjoy a relationship that's, that we're supposed to have with the Lord and with the body. I was so miserable doing that. And that is, that is the prayer. That is the hope. That is what Paul, when you get to that point where you finally say, this is crazy. What am I doing? And turning, repenting, which is turning from your sin, returning to the Lord, returning to the body, 
repenting and coming back. Jesus says in verse 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If two agree on earth about anything what they ask, it shall be done by them, by my Father who is in heaven. We talked of this a little bit a few weeks ago when Jesus said this same thing to Peter. And it's important to just uh, go back to that a little bit because he's saying whatever you bind or loose literally means it will have already been bound in heaven. It will already have been bound or freed in heaven when you do it. See, this is about applying the word of God to the situation. It is not, God's not up in heaven waiting to see what we're going to do about it in order for him to act or to move and to follow our direction. No, again, this is where it comes back to be that we need to be in f- humility when we are being used by God in this way. S- those who are spiritual, Paul says, in tune with the spirit of God, because we need to be hearing from him so that we are doing his will in this action. We need to seek him about how to handle the situation. We need to join in partnership. We need to join in agreement not with each other, but with God. When we agree with one another, as we agree with God, that word agree there is where we get our word, uh, a symphony coming together, the sound together, perfect harmony. First John chapter five, verses 14 and 15, John writes this, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which, which we have asked him. When we are in tune with him and we are praying according to his will, we know we have it because it's his will, his design. He's using us in the process. We join together to seek God's will for his church as to how he wants to deal with the individual people within his church. Again, he's not up in heaven waiting for us to come to our ruling. Then we send the ruling up to him and he obeys by that. Jesus, when we, Jesus, when he speaks of in my name, verse 20, where two or three have gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. That l- literally means into my name. We come into this close, intimate union with Christ. We should never attempt anything that we're talking about here in Matthew 18 without that. Because again, then our flesh can get in the way. Our personal feelings about things and all this other stuff can cloud and cause all sorts of problems. We need to have a conscious, intense awareness of God's spirit communing with us and us following his direction acting only for his glory, free from all fleshly desires and agendas. One final note on this area of church discipline before we move on is, uh, again, we have to be so careful here because church discipline has led to a whole lot of church division. Again, because it was approached with the wrong heart, with the wrong intent, with the wrong attitude. Turn with me to the book of James. The book of James, chapter 3. James chapter 3. Who among you is wise, verse 13, and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, in the gentleness of wisdom. But, verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. 
For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above, note verse 17, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. I believe that, that when we put this section that James writes here alongside what we've just looked at, we can see why church discipline has led to so much church division. Because again, individuals with selfish ambition use Matthew 18 for their own benefit, for their own pursuits. They bring accusations. They bring personal vendettas. They bring personality conflicts as reason to institute Matthew 18 when that has nothing to do with it. Again, there's no biblical sin. It's just a personal thing. And that is where a lot of things, and we'll go and find several people that agree with me on this. And then all of a sudden, well, now I have two or three witnesses and now all, and it's all gets blown out. That's why verse 17, and I took us here in James chapter three is so important. James 3, 17, the wisdom from above is first pure. There's nothing else mixed in it. There's no personal ambition. There's no selfishness. There's no bitterness. There's no me at all. Wisdom from above is first pure because it only comes from above. Unrepentant sin in the life of a believer must be dealt with. It must be dealt with first individually. When we come under conviction, we need to repent. We need to deal with it right away. But if we don't, it's, it's, our, it's our brothers and sisters' responsibility that if they see it, to come to us lovingly, biblically, prayerfully, and bring that to our attention. And if it's not responded to, then the, following the example that Jesus gave, but it should never be used for personal gain, selfish ambition, it's first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. So what do we do? How do we deal with someone who sins against us? We've talked about now when, when a brother or sister sins, but I mentioned the New King James, King James Version says, if your brother sins against you, that we need to deal with that because that happens, right? I mean, people sin against us. How do we deal with that? Well, Jesus addresses that next. Notice in verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. See, that at this time, in the time of Jesus, the rabbis taught that you would forgive someone three times. You know, first time, forgive. Second time, forgive. Third time, three strikes, you're out. <laughs> you forgive, that's it, you're done. So when Peter comes and says, Lord, how many times should I forgive? He's probably thinking, oh, I'm going to get another one of those blessed are you Simons for this. Because man, are you holy. Holy cow, holy Simon, you forget seven times? Man, you are way beyond even the, the, the holiest of Pharisees. No, notice Jesus' response. Not seven times, Peter, but 70 times seven. Okay, now how many of you did the math in your head? How many of you are still struggling with the math in your head? Okay, it's 490, just in, just, but that's not the point. <laughs> Obviously, Jesus is not saying, okay, you forgive 490 times, and then on the 491st time, you don't have to do it anymore. No, the whole point is that forgiveness needs to be a lifestyle for us. If our brother or sister sins, what do we do? Do we, do we go and confront them with it? And if they don't repent, we go and get two or three others and then go. And then if not, then we bring the church and throw them out. No. When someone sins against us, our response, forgive them. Forgive them. Jesus doesn't just leave it there. 
He goes into a, a long parable to explain this. A parable that no doubt many of us are familiar with, beginning in verse 23. Notice he says, for this reason, tying it directly to what he just said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all that he had and that repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and he felt compassion because there was no way, we're going to see this in a second, there was no way he could repay the debt. No way. He felt compassion, notice this, verse 27, and released him and forgave him the debt. Verse 28, but the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. We see Jesus, again, referring to a kingdom parable. We looked at these, several of them, back in chapter 13. Jesus talked about the time he was speaking in parables to them because there is, there is spiritual mysteries that are being revealed through the parables that, that those who have ears to hear and eyes to see will understand. So we need to apply that same thing. We, it's been granted to us the privilege of understanding these things, but there also comes great responsibility with that understanding. There's two major themes in this parable, or two major things that, that kind of jump right out to us. We, we see an unbelievably wealthy king and an unimaginably indebted slave. And it tells us that the king is now settling up accounts. Whatever it is that is owed to him needs to be repaid. Now to just give us an idea of what this slave owed the king, a denarii is worth a day's wage. It was what, the, what a typical worker would earn during one day's of work. That was a denarii. It took six thousand denarii to make up one talent and this slave owed 10,000 talents now again for those of you who are real quick math doing the math all in your head you've got it all figured out by now for the, those of us who are a little slower I did the math on my calculator earlier if you were paying that a day's wage that way, it would take you 100 and si over 164,000 years of working with no days off to earn enough denarii to pay 10,000 talents. Now this was not, Jesus wasn't doing this to find out who was the top of the math class. His point is this is an unpayable debt. There is no way that this slave could ever repay that debt. And notice, he doesn't argue that the debt is owed. He didn't even argue that the penalty was too severe for the debt that was owed. He just cried out for mercy. He didn't, he, he, he didn't question anything else. He just says, have mercy on me. And 
The mercy that was granted was far greater than he even asked. The debt was completely canceled. He walked in owing 10,000 talents. He walked out owing nothing. Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes this, beginning in verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You see, Jesus' parable, again, the story isn't about a king and a slave. The story is about God and us. You see, we owe a debt that we could not possibly repay. And because of that, we face death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that's not physical death it's speaking of. It's talking about spiritual death in eternity. Separated from the love of God, facing the wrath of God in hell forever. That is what we deserve. And we don't argue over the debt that's owed. We don't argue the penalty for it. The king is absolutely holy and righteous. God is perfect. He's absolutely pure. We've talked to that earlier. He is light. There can be no darkness around him at all. So because of that, there's, we, there's nothing that we can do with that. And so we cry out for mercy, and his mercy goes beyond what we could ever even imagine. He paid the debt that he didn't owe. We did for all of us. As Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 2, he cancels out the certificate of debt completely. When I was reading through this again, even this morning, going through uh, the, the text One more time this morning as I'm putting the outline again, kind of the final touches on some things. Verse 27, it jumped out at me again. It tells us the Lord of that slave felt compassion. Again, because he he owed something that he couldn't pay and he's crying out for mercy and he feels compassion for that. But notice it says he released him and forgave him the debt. See, forgiveness means you owe me nothing. Released him completely. He didn't just reduce the amount that was owed to a payable amount and then have him then pay it off over time or whatever. No, he canceled it out completely. Forgiveness means you owe me zero. Nothing. That's how God extends his mercy and his grace to us. And the Bible tells us that those that are forgiven much love much. Those that are forgiven much need to forgive is the point of this. And we, we look at this parable and, and we almost, almost get angry when we see in verse 28 that this slave went out and found one that owed him, you know, uh, it wasn't a small amount. It was a hundred denarii. It's a hundred. De- I mean, it's a, you'd have to work a third of a year to earn that much money. So it's not like it's some small little thing, but in comparison, it's nothing. And he won't forgive that. And he goes, and we, all, we read that. We almost get a little angry. But how often do we do that? We who have been forgiven so much refuse to forgive someone else. Yeah, what they did hurt. Yeah, what they did caused problems. Yes, it's no small thing. But in comparison to what we were forgiven. And again, What does forgiveness look like? How are we supposed to forgive? Well, Jesus says in verse 33, he tells us, should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? The same way. And if we don't, notice, and this is is important, (laughs) verse 32, how does God look at it? Notice, you wicked slave. 
wicked. That's how God sees when we don't forgive someone else. He sees that as wickedness in us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, Paul writes, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. How, how has God forgiven you? <laughs> we, we, we already know completely, right? Totally, we said that. But part of the thing when it comes to releasing someone is they don't bring it up anymore. How many times does God remind you about the sin that you've committed? Ever? No. That's, that's our flesh. That's the enemy. When we start bringing those things back up, God doesn't remind us. The Bible tells us he removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. He's not bringing it up. He's not reminding us of our sin. You know... I was talking with Christina this morning. It's crazy that one of the best examples of forgiveness on a human level comes from a man who the Bible describes as godless. Esau. We, we know the story of Jacob and Esau back in Genesis where, where Jacob steals the blessing of Esau. He, he dresses up and pretends he's Esau and he steals the blessing and all of that. And then he has to run away because Esau wants to kill him and all of this stuff. So we know all of that. Well, fast forward many years and we come to Genesis chapter 33 and Jacob and Esau come face to face again. And Jacob starts sending all of this stuff ahead, all of these gifts, all of these presents, all of this stuff, just in the hopes that Esau will, will have his anger lowered down a few notches and he won't kill them all. And here we come, and they, when they finally come together, Esau runs up to Jacob, hugs him, and, and he's like, what is up with all of this stuff that you're sending me, that you're giving me? And Jacob's like, well... I, I, I want to give this to you. And Esau's like, keep it. I don't, keep it. You don't owe me anything. That is forgiveness. You owe me nothing. God has taken care of that. God has blessed me. Esau had, Esau had great blessing. Jacob, keep it. Notice Esau, if you read it, read Genesis 33. Nowhere does Esau say, but before we get there, you and I got to sit down and hammer this out. We need to talk this through. I think there's a great lesson in that. A lot of times, there, there are going to be times where we need to talk some things through. But for the most part, I think when that happens, a lot of hurts can come back up. A lot of things that should have already been put away and never brought up and discussed again are brought back up. Just put it down. I mean, Esau, again, you don't owe me anything. Brother, let's move forward together from here. I think one of the hardest things in bringing this together, just on a human level, just being all honest. Okay, all right, I can get to this point where I understand that piece, but I can't forget. I can forgive, but I can't forget. And again, I come back to the point, how does God forgive us? And I think that we can get, gain something from Paul again in Philippians chapter 3 when he writes this, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In that, Paul doesn't, it's not when he says forgetting what lies behind, it doesn't mean that his memory is erased and he no longer remembers anything from his past. No, as a matter of fact, Paul is the one on several times when he's giving an account of his testimony, talks about his past. But what he means by that is he is no longer going to allow his past to affect his future. He's no longer going to let those things affect the next steps that he takes. And when we apply that principle to forgiveness, it doesn't mean that we are going to never remember 
the offense. It's not as though, again, we can erase our memory from that hurt. But what it does mean is that I am not going to allow that through bitterness and self-pity and a victim mentality or whatever else to affect how I move forward. That's what it means to forgive and to forget. You owe me nothing. And I am not going to allow what happened in the past to affect how I move forward. Now, that does not mean that if someone has hurt you, if someone has did these types of things, they have to be your best friend again and that we have to go through all that. That's not what it's saying. But do not allow bitterness to enter. Don't allow those emotions and things to come in. Forgive. You owe me nothing. And then move forward. I don't know, as you hear this, if you maybe even are nodding because you don't want anybody else that might be in the room with you to know that inside you're saying, I can't do that. I hear it. I agree with it. But I can't do that. Well, let me ask you a question. Honest answer. Is it God's will that you do that? I know you would agree with me that it is God's will. Then I'm going to read a verse again that I read earlier. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence, confidence, which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests with which we have asked from him. Do you believe in the word of God? then walk like it. How does that look practically? Well, we know it's God's will that we forgive this person and forgive them fully, completely. They owe me nothing, and I'm not going to allow this to affect how I move forward from this moment. So I am going to pray, and I'm going to go to God, and I'm going to say, God, I give this to you. I release this to you. I give it into your hands, and then you need to walk forward believing God's word. Walk it out. Walk like you believe it. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this life that I now live, forgiving them and walking forward, I live as with Christ in me. I live in faith. I walk it out in faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. The one who said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing as they nailed him to the cross is the one who lives in you. And as you walk in faith, forgiving and moving forward, he's the one who will ensure. He is the one who will make sure that it happens. You say, I can't. You can't alone. You can't in you. Your flesh can't. But Jesus in you, absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for, again, your word. We thank you for the fact that even though we can't gather together face to face, we can gather together in this way around your word. And Lord, we do pray that your word would, would settle deep into our hearts, that you, would, that you would work within us. Lord, you, you love us individually. You love your body, the church, and you give us these instructions as to how we are to act as your children, as your church. Lord, we thank you that though we owed a debt that we could never pay, you paid that debt, a debt that you didn't owe. so that we could have this fellowship, so that we could be called children of God, so that we could have our sins completely removed, the debt completely canceled. We could share eternity together with you. Lord, I pray that 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 truth again would be something today, even in a... (laughs) 
even in a more real way, would just settle in our hearts and we praise you and we thank you for that. But Lord, I pray that that would also lead us to understand that we have no right to hold a debt against anyone else. If you're hearing this right now and and there's someone that you need to forgive, there's a situation that you need to let go of, there's a debt that you need to cancel completely, And maybe you've said, I can't, over and over again. I challenge you now, just simply go before God and just pray, Lord, I know it's your will that I forgive them. And your word says that if I pray according to your will, you hear, and if you hear, I know that I have what I'm asking. So right now, Lord, I ask you, to help me forgive them right here, right now, to cancel this debt. They owe me nothing. And help me to walk forward from here, never allowing this hurt, this this wrong, to ever affect one more step of my life following after you. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We ask that you would move in a supernatural way, even in the next few days in this situation that faces us all with this coronavirus. But Lord, should it be your will that this last a little longer, Lord, would you give us opportunity this week to shine your light? To be that voice of of peace and assurance that so many people need to hear now because they they don't have it. There's there's so much confusion and so much craziness and, Lord, so much anxiety. Lord, let the peace that you give us flow through to others. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. We'll talk to you soon.